Hello, everyone. This is Casey with Bitcoin Magazine on Meet the Taco Clubs. And I have an excellent guest with us here today, Nelson Chen, who has submitted uh, nearly an entire series. We're about uh, 60, 70 percent of the way through. And uh, it's been absolutely fantastic. Nelson, why don't you uh, introduce yourself? Hey, Casey, thanks for having me. Yeah, my background, uh, I'm Nelson. I'm you know at Swan Bitcoin, and I have a background as a Silicon Valley techie. Um, in terms of degree, I have an accounting background, so I really appreciate the uh, kind of revolution that Bitcoin is as it's you know a ledger that keeps track of numbers. Um, but in terms of my recent history, you know I've always been in tech sales for the most part and you know have a bit of a coding background as well. Um, and lastly, just for context for this conversation, you know, I've been an investor in a lot of stocks, tech stocks, primarily for the last 15 years, more or less. So that kind of sets the uh, the background in terms of who I am. Absolutely. So um, you've you've written an excellent series so far with us. Um, but before we get into the series, I want to ask you about your Bitcoin rabbit hole story and how you actually got into the space uh, in the first place. Yeah, so. I first heard about Bitcoin back in 2015, I wrote it off just because it sounded pretty ridiculous, like who's going to reinvent money? It just sounded way too far-fetched. And then two years later, 2017, summer of, I was at a pool party in LA and one of my best friends was asking me, hey, like, I'm not a technical guy, but hey, Nelson, can you take a look at this for me? And at the time he was looking at ETH because a lot of his friends were investing in ETH and making tons of money. So I took a look at the white paper gave him my quick opinion. I said, look, I don't really understand what this is, but it sounds super cool on the surface. So like many of us, you know, I went fell down the ETH rabbit hole first, ultrasound, super advanced, you know, version of Bitcoin. Sounded like a no brainer at the time. But, um, you know, as with many of us who end up in, in a Bitcoin uh, frame of mind, you know, I, I just didn't really understand fully what, what you know, what exactly Bitcoin was, uh, because on the surface, it is very counterintuitive. So, you know, I went through the whole thing in 2017, 2018. I just got wrecked in the crash, like a lot of people. Um, but realistically, like me being an investor in stocks, I bought into ETH mostly as an investment opportunity for 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 gains. Uh, but as I started to do my due diligence in that 2018 crash, I really started to uh, the the things that started to emerge were the differences between ETH and Bitcoin. And a lot of the thing, a lot of the cracks started to emerge in the ETH story, and a lot of the things that were really boring became way more interesting on the Bitcoin side. As I learned about Lightning Network and all these other things that could be built on top of it, so those things kind of sucked me down the rabbit hole. Uh, I picked up a couple of books: the Bitcoin Standard, Internet of Money, a lot of the the good standards that are out there that everyone gets into, and that's really like the story. I, I kind of realized that you know, where I started, it looked like a sexier, cooler object with ETH, but it turned out to be a complexity machine. And the more I learned about Bitcoin, the more amazing it, it became as I learned about more things, difficulty adjustment, all those little things that come out and how and just how ingenious it all is and how elegant the solution is. Um, so that's really when I realized, I think it was probably like end of 2018, I started to really click with me that Bitcoin is going to be the future of money. Um, largely because it's going to maintain this this sense of longevity because of its architecture, because of its simplicity, mm -hmm. and it until that clicks, like it, it's just hard to see it. So yeah, that's when I became full on Bitcoin maximalist. Absolutely, I think that's a, a common trend to kind of get allured by the uh, outward appeal of those uh, altcoins, also known as shitcoins, and uh, and just kind of be beguiled by their by their outward appearance. And then once you um, kind of dive into the deeper aspects of the Bitcoin network and the uh, ramifications of the simplicity, because on its on its face, the simplicity might seem like a, a fault. Um, and I think once you kind of dive into why it's simple and uh, why the decisions were made in its development, uh, there's a lot to be learned and, and it changes your perspective. Um, and going off of that, I would like to ask you, how has Bitcoin changed your life? Because I'm sure, as has been reflected in your in your series, um, there have been many changes in your train of thought. Yeah, that's a that's a very good question, because for me, my whole life just went orange, really. I mean, I'm not just saying that, like everything in my mind and just how I was thinking about life changed. Uh, so after doing all that diligence on Bitcoin and realizing that, you know, for me, like I just came to that realization, Bitcoin is the, the, the one true coin. It's just the one that is going to be, everything is going to be built on this when we look back in 10, 20 years. 
Uh, that's the conclusion I arrived at. So I really dropped everything in my life and started to pursue just Bitcoin. And so really it changed everything. It changed my the way I look at time. It changed the way I look at money. And realistically, for anyone in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, whatever age you're talking about, like you can't really live life and, and not have your life altered when your actual foundational understanding of time and money change. Because those are the two biggest things outside of your own being and family that really are moving your life around and, and kind of changing your behaviors. So, you know, for me growing up in my 20s, I had this, I had this struggle with this, what I like to call the, the time money paradox, where it seemed like you can have one, but not the other. Mm-hmm. And, you know, for me, I, I spent a lot of time just chasing money in my 20s um, and just giving up all my time. And I'm not saying it didn't work out well for me, but I'm, but once I found Bitcoin, it became this thing that made so much sense because it let me use time and money and they kind of moved concurrently in the same direction. And it wasn't a, a conflicting uh, kind of situation where with fiat, everything kind of slips through your fingers. But now I can actually get money and I know that in the long term, it's going to be it will continue stacking with me right as, as time goes on. So game changer. I mean, I, it just changed my, my, my entire kind of life trajectory because it changed the way I, it changed my relationship with, with both money and time. And when you think about how to plan your own life and your own future, and that's something that, that I've always done, uh, that, that just changes everything in terms of where you can actually see yourself going. Definitely. Um, I think that's a common theme amongst people who really dive deep into Bitcoin. I think, um, I think you touched a, uh, on a lot of these ideas in your series. Um, you've got titles like Bitcoin Returns Self-Empowerment to People. Uh, you've got Bitcoin Illuminates Inflation in the Fog. So you you do touch a lot on these things uh, in your series. And uh, going off of that, I want to ask you what inspired you to write your series on Jordan Peterson for the magazine? Um, because it's been such an interesting uh, series to kind of dive into philosophically as well as uh, looking at how you address like Bitcoin, uh, the network. Yeah, I think, so I uh, just for context in terms of timing, I first fell down the Bitcoin rabbit hole. And then a friend of mine had given me a Jordan Peterson book a recommendation, and it was just sitting on my shelf for years. Mm-hmm. And I picked it up and I just said, hey, I'm going to read this because I know a lot of the people in the community, it, it was like Jordan Peterson, and it kept coming up in, in conversations. So I, I went down that path. And as I was reading it, it was just a revelation because it made me, I'm from Silicon Valley. So I'm steeped in the, you know, computers are going to solve everything and apps are going to save the world and all that sort of stuff. Um, But Jordan Peterson's work was such a, was such a a kind of flippening in my own head, because in tech, we have this strong belief that big tech at scale is going to solve all of our problems. And we have a tendency to put technology in numbers first. And Jordan Peterson, he's a clinical psychologist. So, you know, he it's not that he ignores technology and numbers at all. But what he says is like, let's take a look at the human beings first. Let's look at the humans and the stories first. And then let the narrative from the numbers help fill in the gaps in terms of those uh, those those stories that we tell about people. Um, so it kind of reframed, Jordan reframed a lot of the way I look at life. And he made he he brought a lot of balance to the way I look at life because when you grow up in Silicon Valley, it's it's such a uh, it's such a it's such a bubble where people are just looking at everything through tech, 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 and it's almost like the people are secondary because it's like we can make tech that'll change people's behaviors. But I think the part that Jordan is filling in is like how are people actually how are people and their behaviors going to change uh, and and kind of their behaviors moving tech along as well because there's two sides of that coin, so. You know, when it comes to a lot of what what Bitcoin and Jordan Peterson are talking about, they're talking about a lot of the same topics. You're talking about morality, truth, quality, responsibility. Uh, you know, these things are just very key and core to to the heart of what a lot of Silicon Valley tech is centered around as well, about trying to build good products. Unfortunately, I think a lot of Silicon Valley has kind of gone off the deep end a little bit and, and started to kind of lose their grasp on a lot of the morality and the truth and the quality and responsibility. And it's gone down a path of just like monetization and just like data aggregation. And it's become quite creepy in, in a large extent. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think reading Jordan Peterson, it was such a breath of fresh air because he's he's saying, hey, like there is a way to think about life in, in like a like a way that's not morally hazardous, that actually is good for people in the long run. And that is something that does align very, very well with Bitcoin. Um, and Bitcoin is refreshing as a technology because it has the power to change people's behaviors 
Uh, but it's also people willing to adopt it because people are figuring out what it is. And then they in turn are both, both things are basically changing one another. And that's the thing that I think is missing in tech. And so when I, when, when I started writing this piece on Jordan Peterson, it was just so much overlap between what he's talking about and what tech is. And then there's Bitcoin is in the middle, basically. And it all just kind of came together. And I think a lot of other people in the world that, that, read his books and our Bitcoiners see the exact same thing. Yep. Yep. I think, uh, I think you said the truth there, a lot there. Um, I think you totally uh, are right about how technology is perceived and kind of headed into the direction of monetization. And uh, I really agree that that Bitcoin uh, is kind of uh, a reflection or, or a very similar, um, you know, thing that, that is the opposite of that and really represents the humanitarian side of, of future technology and what we can look forward to, um, you know, coming out of technology. Um, so I do want to ask you out of the series, um, what do you think is the most important lesson that we've touched on? Uh, because there have been so many things that we've talked about uh, as we've been publishing this. Yeah, we've covered a lot. And I think that the chapter that stands out the most to me is chapter two which is titled Imagine What Your Life Could Be, and then aim single-mindedly at that. And I think that on the surface, it sounds like a lot of the chapters, it sounds very like no shit, Sherlock kind of thing. But uh, when you actually dissect what he's saying, uh, really what he's saying is like, let's look back at history because imagination, you, you have two things. You have history and how you use that to uh, in the present and moving forward. Um, and then you have this idea of people as actors on a grand stage. And lastly, you have this idea of stories before numbers. And so when he says, imagine what you could be, what he's talking about is imagination is truly human beings greatest asset. And so our great imaginations as a species has always allowed us to take things to the next level. But the way that we actually use our imagination is through the format of stories. And so you know, to, to kind of take a blurb from his work, he says, we are all infinitely complex beings, each of us so full of potential, it transcends our understanding. So how do we figure out what we could be? So part of what he's saying is that if you just stumble through life and just try and make the most of it, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But realistically, we have thousands and thousands of years of hard fought stories from our ancestors where they went through and battled a lot of demons and, and things throughout their world and their life. And ultimately the blueprint that they lived, a lot of those, those things are so foundational that no matter what the tech is and differences from then to today, it's, it's a lot of the same problems because the problems that they were battling are ultimately human problems. So even though we have so much technology in our world today and it's changing and reshaping a lot of what we see and what we do and how we live, ultimately a lot of the foundational problems that we deal with are ultimately with each other. It's still a person to person and it's even internal, just us within ourselves. So mm -hmm. like part of what his message here is like, look, let's not reinvent the wheel here. Like we, we, we don't have to do that. Like we have so many stories. Let's leverage these stories to our advantage. And this is part of what I love about Bitcoin is that a lot of people look at Bitcoin as a scary new technological thing. And it's really not the case in terms of what it is. If you really look at what it is foundationally, what it is, is it takes the protocol of gold, which is as old as, as the earth, basically. And it looks at like, what are the properties that makes gold really valuable? And let me figure out how to actually represent that as code. And then let me give it a twist. Let me give it a superpower. And that superpower is teleportation. So what it's actually doing with Bitcoin, it seems on the surface as super advanced futuristic, but actually what it is, is super, super old because it's using an old blueprint and then it's actually improving upon it. So in the chapter, it goes through a story of this thing called Materia Prima, which is ancient alchemy. Mm -hmm. And the ancient alchemy was basically like this idea of taking lesser metals and forming it into gold, right? This kind of a uh, magical, magical trick or this alchemical uh, reaction. And when I look at Bitcoin, I just, I, I don't know how else to see that other than literally somebody taking the blueprint of gold that's analog and then digitizing it and then giving it a, a twist, giving it a superpower. So mm -hmm. there's so much between our chapter, this chapter and with Bitcoin and how, like how Bitcoin was formed and why Bitcoin is so effective. And I think largely it's because it actually does honor so much of what was in our past. 
but it just takes it, modernizes it, and 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 it helps us as a civilization move onward in a better way. And if that's like the the that's the most perfect example of modern day alchemy, as, as far as I'm concerned, uh, because I don't think the answer in life is just to tear down everything that you see and just try and rebuild it from scratch. And I think a lot of the modern movements, uh, I'm not saying they're bad in 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 their entirety, but I'm saying that like it's very dangerous to just tear down entire institutions and think. Uh, that you can just rebuild them like from scratch, brand new. Uh, it's just not that easy. A lot of these institutions that have been around, they they may not be perfect, but they've existed for you know maybe thousands of years. And part of the reason that they they function well is because it took thousands of years to figure out how to structure these things properly to actually run a civilization. So mm-hmm. I'm not against change, uh, and I'm and I'm not against uh, the other side of it either. But all I'm saying is that we need something in the middle that is going to honor both sides, the past and the future, and bring it all together. And so imagine what you could be then aim single-mindedly at that encapsulates that, I think, to a T, because we're looking at a lot of our own imagination to invent Bitcoin. But a lot of the imagination of what Bitcoin is, uh, is ultimately something that comes from the past in gold. And and then now we have a whole crew of people that are just aimed single mindedly at Bitcoin. So I think that, you know, when you go through the chapter of, of that second chapter, he talks not only about that alchemical prima material con- concept, but he also talks about like the biblical story of Exodus. He talks about, you know, the Enuma Elish. And some of these things are bridging this gap between uh, between these two worlds, right? This old, old stories, but let's look at it through the context of Bitcoin. I mean, in Bitcoin, you have the idea of the virgin birth with Satoshi giving birth, and he's this enigmatic creator giving birth to, to Bitcoin. And nobody really knows who he is, right? So it has a lot of these fingerprints of, of between Bitcoin and these timeless stories. Mm-hmm. And I think that's really what it boils down to is, is like part of what makes Bitcoin so sticky and part of what makes it so captivating is that it does follow these arcs of these timeless stories that are very, very hard to ignore. And so I think once people get into Bitcoin and and sink their teeth into it a little bit, these things kind of appear. And part of the reason why like people like us become so single-mindedly focused on Bitcoin is because what it is is so compelling because it, it is something that is this unforgettable story even now. So you know, these, I think like the, the summary there is that like, imagine your life with Bitcoin, aim single mindedly at it. And realistically, like a lot of us do that because what it is in its whole is a timeless story that pulls together both the past and the future. And we in the present are able to basically benefit from both these, both these timelines and move forward confidently because we have this strong binding. It's like, it binds the past and the present and the future altogether in the present, just the proof of work, right? Like the mm-hmm. proof of work itself is using the present energy physically on earth to actually empower the network and to protect it. So it just brings everything together, right? I mean, if you imagine life and how it should be, it should be a life where we honor the past, we are strengthened by the present, and we have a clear vision for the future. And I think that in all the world today, like we just don't have that sort of thing. Like it's all broken across the board. And I think ultimately the way I see life today, when you look at money, like money's become so distorted that people's, uh, it's actually warping people's perception of reality itself. Mm -hmm. So if you think about what money is in terms of like fiat currencies and US dollars and all that stuff, I mean, it's touching every part of our lives. And when people are looking around wondering, like, why is everything wrecked in the world? Well, it should come as no surprise that, like, the one common theme across the board is that money is touching everything in all of these pockets. And when the money is being devalued so badly, it's very hard to look at the future because it looks like a mess, Mm -hmm. right? And the present is also a mess because, like, no one knows what's going to happen to the dollar tomorrow. Are they going to raise the interest rate, lower the interest rate? It's so unpredictable. It's a very stressful way to live. And so... It's all about like this idea of bringing predictability to the present so that you have clarity of the future. And we just don't have that today. And I think that what Bitcoin ultimately is, is it raises the bar for money. And when you raise the bar for money, people are able to rise to that level. Mm -hmm. But when money is actually being devalued and depreciated, then you're actually ruining people's ability to be moral human beings and do the right thing and tell the truth. because 
the level of money has become so low that people are actually sinking to that level because there is no rising to a high level when the money is trash. Like if, if you knew that if you knew that the money tomorrow was going to get devalued like a million percent, you're not going to work nearly as hard. Like that's mm-hmm. just the reality, right? Like you just know that the money is worthless. Yep. So it's going to mess with your ability to do your work. But if you knew tomorrow that the money is going to get a thousand times better, then all of a sudden that's also going to help you and your work ethic, right? It's going to change you. And so I think that today there's a lot of good people in the world that fall down a slippery slope of becoming shittier, but it's not necessarily their fault. It's just that the money is becoming shittier and they're falling to that level. So I would love to see like, if we get this standard of a Bitcoin standard implemented in people's lives, it's something that they can anchor around and hold on to and, and, and be, be confident in that raises their standard and they can rise to that occasion. And I think that's like the most amazing thing about Bitcoin. All right, let's take a quick break from that episode. I want to tell you guys about our sponsor. It is Bitcoin 2022 conference. I am sure you saw the videos. You may have been there in person. Bitcoin 2021 was an absolute smashing success. It was the biggest conference in Bitcoin history, crypto history, whatever history of the digital asset sphere. Bitcoin is number one in the Bitcoin 2021 conference is number one with a bullet. It was an absolutely incredible time. I was working my ass off the whole time, but I got to meet so many incredible community members. And I think the best testament to how amazing Bitcoin 2021 was, was not just all of the amazing, you know, accolades and uh, and compliments that I got personally and our team got, but also it's the skin in the game in Bitcoin 2022. We have already sold close to 1500 tickets. That is more than 10% of the people, everyone who went to Bitcoin 2021 have already purchased tickets to Bitcoin 2022. We have not released a date. We have not released a city. We have not released anything. That is the biggest compliment. That is the biggest skin in the game of the community being down for this conference. Bitcoin 2022 is going to be bigger than Bitcoin 2021. It is going to be better than Bitcoin 21 in every single way. And we are going to be bringing you the best opportunity to mingle with the biggest, the baddest, the most Bitcoin people on the planet. So join the revolution. Go to b.tc forward slash conference. Get your tickets today. I don't know what the ticket prices are. They are going up. I think they're $249 right now. We just rolled out fiat ticket uh, purchases. All the tickets purchased before today were all purchased in BTC. So get it, guys. Get it. Get this ticket. Be at Bitcoin 2022. See you there. Bitcoiners, I want to tell you guys about The Deep Dive. The Deep Dive is a new premium newsletter from the Bitcoin Magazine team in conjunction with my man, BTCization, Dylan LeClaire. Dylan is such a multifaceted and wide-ranging analyst. He does everything from on-chain analytics to macro uh, analysis to uh, you know hash rate and all that kind of good stuff. He does it all. He breaks down everything that's happening every single day with his daily dive. He's going to dive into what is happening in the market that day. So that way you don't have to pay attention to Twitter. You don't have to pay attention to anything else. You can just pay attention to the deep dive and he has you covered. And at the end of the week, guess what? You get a weekly recap. And at the end of the month, hey, we have a freaking report, a beautiful PDF breaking down all the activity of that entire month, what it means for Bitcoin, what you can expect moving forward. The Bitcoin market is going to moon We are here to make sure that we maximize your stack. Go to members.bitcoinmagazine.com to sign up today. And if you use promo code BITS, you can get one month for free. So again, the deep dive, I've been checking it out every day and you should too. Back to the show. Well, you've said so many true things there. I mean, the reflection of of Bitcoin uh, being a reflection of the past, I think that's, that's so true. Um, and I think that really touches on, on uh, as you said, as the money or money gets worse, um, uh, people, their decisions become uh, impacted by that. And I think u- utilizing and leveraging the stories of the past uh, to create this uh, futuristic money that is sound and um, kind of fights back against these problems that we've created uh, I think that's, as you said, the clear vision forward, right? Um, and so uh, in this time of, of great 
great distress and, and confusion, I think that's really our, our signal forward. Um, yeah, I think I think uh, to add on to your thought there, I think really like Bitcoin is retelling a reimagined story of all these ancient things that we've we've discussed. And I think the thing that's so exciting and inspiring about that is that we all as people, like a lot of people that you know, maybe your parents, maybe your 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 cousins, whoever it is that are older, especially like they have that jaded look in their eyes where they're just tired of life and they're just beating them down. And I think part of the reason of all that is because a lot of people are forced to live lives where it's not really like when you when you ask them, hey, tell me about your job. It's not really a story that they want to tell. Like there's not really a like an exciting thing that they want to say, yeah, this is what I did. And it helped humanity in a big way. Right. Mm -hmm. Like people are not really living lives that they want to retell. And I think that's part of the problem. And I think that's a lot of what Jordan Peterson is talking about is that ultimately instead of looking at life as just a, a game where we're trying to collect like a Ferrari or this or that of big houses, like look at life as people, as actors on a stage and the roles that we play, because ultimately those are the things that you're going to remember and look back on in life and be proud of. So I think part of the Bitcoin story looking forward, when I think about family and children, all that stuff is like, I want to live a life where I can be proud and sit down and tell them that like I was part of this journey with Bitcoin and we help bring the world that you see today into fruition. I know it might be super boring to you because that's just like we all use Bitcoin, right? So, yeah, isn't that no shit, right? But it's very it's nonetheless going to be something in all of our lives that we will be able to keep retelling. And I think that's part of the timeless story is that it's something that keeps getting told and retold through the generations. And Bitcoin, because of its nature, the way it's architected, it is guaranteed to have this longevity for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. So what better thing to attach yourself to if you want to tell an unforgettable story than something that is going to stand the test of time and that can change humanity for the better that we can all coalesce around and be stronger for. And I mean, what, what better story can you possibly come up with? So that's my take. Excellent. I, I, I think so many people are going to relate to that and, and love that perspective, Nelson. Um, we are getting close to out of time, but I want to ask you one more question. I wanted to, uh, talk about what you are most looking forward to in the Bitcoin space personally. Yeah. So, you know, we've talked on, touched on some topics, but I think the theme here is that you have technology and you have numbers, but ultimately the things that are more important than that are the people and the stories that we tell, because those are the things that carry on through the ages. And so when I think about people, I think about, like I said, like the morality, the ability to tell the truth with one another and not cover things up or hide things, you know, the quality of who we are and, and ultimately the fact that we all take responsibility for our lives. So I think that these things are foundational things that Bitcoin Trojan horses into people's lives. Like when they're chasing after number go up, like ultimately what they get is like, wow, this thing is actually changing me almost on in a very uh, subliminal kind of way. And then the word that comes to mind behind all this that I'm really looking forward to is I was, I'm seeing in terms of the human changes, I'm very interested to see the change in people's communities. So we see things happening in El Salvador. Uh, we th see things happening in Miami just a month or, month or so ago. And to be around the community of people where Bitcoin is changing the underpinnings of their lives, it's really inspiring to see. And I'm very curious to see how that goes in, in these different segments of the world where Bitcoin is being adopted on, on, on local levels, because that's what it's all about here. Like We know that at the top level, at the governmental level, the people that run the world we're going to let them do them. It's like, it's almost outside of our control. Like they, they just do whatever they want at this point, right? We're just regular people. We, we just live our lives. But what we can do is we can make sovereign decisions for ourselves and to see grassroots movements where people are taking up the torch and running with it and, and you know, doing what's best for them, for them without harming other people. Like that's amazing. And I think that it's going to create incredible communities. And I think we all see that in the meetups that we go to, in the communities that we're a part of, um, and ultimately, I think as that continues to, to spread and become uh, and take root all over the world, you're going to see these very, very strong people come to the forefront. And they're going to be people that think about things that are very uncommon in the in the common lexicon of, of civilization, where most people are so concerned about just the, the money I'm going to make right now and, and this right now. And it's all FOMO and YOLO. Like a lot of Bitcoiners are thinking about five years, 10 years, like this thing, I'm, I'm, I'm shooting for this thing way down the road. And I'm being very frugal right now because I want to live a better life. And I think these are very strong foundations to build communities around that will last for a very, very long periods of time. And I think it'll take time because I think 
part of the world that we live in is very forgiving. And like a lot of the mistakes that are made in the fiat world, they get papered over by more fiat. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the a lot of the mistakes that we make in the Bitcoin world are very punishing. Like if you fuck up your private key, it's very punishing. So the good thing about punishing lessons is that you tend to learn from them. When you paper over lessons with with fiat money, lessons aren't learned. They just go go by the wayside. So I'm very interested to see how the community, the sense of community will actually um, come together. I'm just looking forward to seeing that same kind of tightness in the communities across the world. And um, yeah, I mean, I think on a technological level, I think that, you know, Strike is obviously and Lightning Network are amazing. Um, Strike and, and Sphinx Chat specifically, I think are just really, really amazing products. And I think the truth of the matter is, is that I'm, I'm so excited because I think about, I, I mean, I used AOL Instant Messenger back in the day, and we thought that that was incredible back then. And I think in the timeline, that application, AOL Instant Messenger, is probably similar to what Strike and Sphinx are. Like these, they're super like mind blowing to me right now. But that only tells me that in 10 years time, I can only imagine the applications that are going to come on top of this. And it's just unbelievable because I know that I'm just going to have my mind blown. So every day I wake up and I, I plug away at Bitcoin, uh, knowing that there's an incredible future that's going to be here in about 10 years time. And it's just absolutely a pleasure to uh, to be a part of that this story, right? Because I think we're doing the right thing for all the right reasons. And, you know, you know, people's hearts and their minds are in the right place because everyone's trying to make a better world. And it's not just for the money and it's not just for greed and it's not just for like the, the bullshit that that runs the world today. Like we're doing it because we're actually trying to make a better world. Um, and that sounds like fluff, but why don't you spend a year in Bitcoin and really sink your teeth into it? And you'll see that like there's something deeper here that often gets overlooked in the uh, in the in the shitcoin casinos out there. Like there's something real here that you can build civilizations on top of. And that's not, that's, you know, that's no small feat and it's no small thing, but people that put in their time and put in their work, um, they reap the benefits of it. And they, 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 they're able to anchor their life onto something highly predictable, regardless of what the fiat price of Bitcoin is. And that's what some, that's what everybody in this world needs today. Everybody in this world lives in such an unpredictable, precarious environment. And the one thing everybody can use flat out is something that they can just anchor around, something that they can grab onto, something that they feel like, I know what this is, I'm confident in it, and I can I can roll with this thing in the future. Like, that's no doubt. And that's Bitcoin in a nutshell. So I'm looking forward to all of it. So true, Nelson. I, I think you've really hit the nail on the head several times uh, during our conversation today. Um, I want to thank you for coming on Meet the Taco Plebs. Uh, I want to encourage everyone to go check out your series on bitcoinmagazine.com. Um, thanks again, Nelson. Swan is very lucky to have you. And um, it's just been awesome to publish this. So I'm, I'm excited to finish out this series with you. Yeah, thank you as well, Casey, for all your hard work. It's been a pleasure working with you and Bitcoin Magazine. And yeah, I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to write for you guys. It's been an absolute pleasure. And I look forward to doing more of it. Awesome, man. I'll see you later. Later, bud.